All right, thank you so much for joining us for today's Senior Housing Officer Virtual Roundtable. Uh, my name is Spencer Kesey. I'm a Research and Education Specialist at AKUI, and I'm thrilled that you're joining us for this session to help both connect senior housing officers in the field, um, share what you're experiencing, and hopefully take some great knowledge back to your home campuses. Um, if you are, this session is being recorded, so if you've got a colleague who couldn't make it today, that you'd like to refer them to this, this will be posted on our YouTube channel under a QOI tomorrow. But before we get started, I'll give you a preview of our outstanding panel today. You've all, you'll also see them on webcam. So thank you, panelists. We're going to get to you in just a moment. A few QOI items I'd like to point out. Uh, first of all, we've released our QOI Stories podcast that is now found wherever you listen to podcasts. Feel free to subscribe, like, um, rate us however you'd like to. Our first episode is with Alvin Sturdivant from Seattle University. We'd be thrilled if you joined in. I promise you'll enjoy it. Take a nice walk in the park, listen to some of Kuwai stories. We have a busy month in April coming up from a Kuwai. Uh, we have three large scale virtual offerings. We have our mid level leadership institute from April 6th to 9th. And later on in the month, we have a small college and university symposium and a live-in staff symposium. So please, uh, if you are a staff member or have staff members that fall into those areas, um, certainly take a look on our AKUI webpage for more information. For our small uh, for our small college and university symposium, as well as our live-in symposium, we do have team access passes available to attend those. So. If you are a supervisor of, or if you have a large number of live-in staff in your department, and you think our, that symposium could be a great opportunity for them for some virtual professional development, we'd love to have you take a look at our team pass options. Um, also, the Conference and Expo is live for registration, and we have until April 6th for early discounts on registration for that. Again, there's individual and team pass registrations available for our Conference and Expo which will be in June virtually. And finally, there's a wealth of information that you can find on our online community, on our web webpage, and on our YouTube channel. So certainly if there's anything you're looking for, or if you wanna engage more in the field, take a look at those resources. A few points about our session today. We are in a webinar format today. So you will see the videos of our panelists um, and your opportunity to engage is through the Q&A button. So feel free at any point to use the question and answer button to submit questions you may have or topics you'd like to see us cover. You also have the ability to engage with our panelists through the chat function. So certainly if you see a friend out there, you'd like to share some kudos, or at some point you wanna share what you're experiencing in your campus with the rest of the attendees, you could use that chat function. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to our panelists. I'm gonna have each of them introduce themselves to you. And our question to get us started is just, what are you experiencing in March? on your campuses. And I'm going to pass it over to Tim from Tulane to start us out. All right, very good. Thanks, Spencer. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Tim Lemford. Um, I use he, him, his pronouns, and I serve as the Director of Housing and Residence Life at Tulane University. Um, for those of you who don't know Tulane, we're um, a private institution in New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, we have about uh, 4,000 beds uh, on campus. Um, I am uh, excited to be here today. Um, March has been uh, particularly busy. I think March is always busy uh, in housing and residence life and in the midst of a pandemic even more so. Um, but we're uh, at this point, we are in the throes of our room selection process. We're um, grateful to be committed to be on ground and in person again uh, next fall. Um, and so we are um, going through all of the joy that, that brings um, our occupancy managers um, that's returning student room selection right now. Um, and we're also um, knee deep in our planning, not only for um, finishing up for planning for closing, but uh, get ready to think about how we're gonna welcome everybody back to campus uh, next year. So I know in a, in a little while, we'll get into those details in just a bit, but that's that's been my march so far. Hi everyone, my name is Val Veronica Scales. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Director of Resident Life uh, here at the University of Maryland in College Park, a large research institution and the land grant institution of um, Maryland. What have I been up to this March? Well, we had in-person um, spring break. So we actually closed the university for an entire week uh, last week. And so right now, I know, 
Um, so right now we are welcoming back our students, uh, making sure that they're getting tested and making sure that they adhere to the guidelines to get tested 72 hours before they came back to campus. Um, we have about 8,000 beds on campus and 3,000 within our P3s. And so managing that process is not an easy feat um, and trying to make sure our, our students and staff are still healthy. Um, like Tim, we are in um, room selection right now. We just had open leasing for our P3s um, and we're trying to determine how many students will actually be able to house in the fall semester because we're going to 92 percent um, and uh, we're not doing any triples or quads and so it's, it's going to be a very difficult process for our team um, because we did allow anyone to cancel in the fall semester to keep their priority you know hindsight is 2020 so um, and we've had over 3,000 residents take us up on that offer already and completed uh, housing applications so um, that's what we've been up to this month uh, and we're also um, trying to figure out uh, testing for the fall and quarantine isolation housing for the fall semester as well. So I'm happy to be here. I'll stop talking. I know we're going to talk about a lot of these things later, but um, thanks for the invitation, Spencer. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dee Goins. I'm the current interim dean of student support services at UNT Dallas, temporarily. I'm also uh, the director of housing and residence life. Our march right now is... Um, I'm trying to figure out how to how to get some revenue in the summer. So we are really focused on right now identifying what our, our summer camps and conference season will look like. Um, our housing application for the fall is also open right now. But um, for me, my priority is how do we still welcome our external guests and community partners to, to a safe environment for them to pull off some of the programs that they want to do. So uh, we're trying to be very strategic with that. And so that's what... Uh, I've been spending the last few days in March doing. Hi everyone, my name is April Barnes and I have the pleasure to serve at the University of South Carolina as the Executive Director of University Housing. Um, our March has been a little bit crazy as well. Uh, we did not do spring break. However, our governor opened up um, businesses um, past kind of the regulations he's already set up, which caused some spikes in our COVID positive um, population for our students. Um, and like everyone else, you know, housing never stops. So we too are working on our camps and conferences and getting that those approvals through. We have kind of two separate approval processes that we need to go through um, as well as um, trying to get applications in, get people sorted into their learning communities for the fall and plan for fall as well. So it's, it is busy. Oh, also we're recruitment. It's in the middle of recruitment season for residence life. And so we've been doing a lot of that. Uh, and so it, March definitely keeps you hopping. Hi, everybody. My name is Tim Touchette. I'm the Assistant Dean for Student Affairs at Brandeis University. We're in Waltham, Massachusetts, so just a stone's throw from downtown Boston. Um, I've been at Brandeis for around seven years. And prior to being here, I was just down the road at Northeastern University in Boston. Here at Brandeis, we have about a 3,000 bed inventory during a normal year. Uh, this year has been anything but normal. We're around 1,900 um, with all the different COVID restrictions. Uh, March has been interesting. March has been uh, the weather in this area in the Northeast swung really warm about a week and a half ago, and so did the COVID positivity rate. Um, our governor and leadership here at both the university and, and the municipality changed a lot of the restrictions and we saw uh, an explosion in COVID numbers. So we're trying to manage that. Um, it has not been fun at all. We managed to never have more than six or seven in isolation at the same time. And those numbers tripled last week. Um, so it was almost too good to be true, but that has been what most of March has been. And just about an hour ago, well, we too also started our room selection process by sending out room selection numbers. So the phones have lit up like a Christmas tree. I can see those off on the screen to my right. Uh, <laughs> and you might hear them in the background, but. March is always an exciting time on campuses this year for better reasons than last March, um, but we'll discuss some of those items today. So thank you. All right, and thank you to our panelists. We're thrilled that you're joining us today. Um, and thank you for registering for this session. Our, we have three topics that uh, we have gleaned from your uh, registration information as you, we asked you what are some topics you'd like to see us cover in our session today. Um, our three topics we'll be covering next are supporting live-in staff, testing vaccine requirements for residents, and fall opening plans. So we will start off with supporting live-in staff. Um, I'll just have our panelists share what are some things they're doing to support their live-in staff as we are now a year into a pandemic.
I can jump in if we want to start. Um, one of the things that we were faced with here, much like many of you, is our team were the only staff members, aside from facilities and dining, that were left on the campus when everyone got in their cars and, and went home and took all their computer equipment with them. Um, and so many of the tasks to keep the university functioning fell to the live-in staff members. Um, even my secondary level team, which is a mid-management team of directors and associate and assistant directors all live off campus. So trying to create a safe means by which they could come in and out of the office as well to support the live-in staff was really challenging. Um, I did end up uh, doing a presentation. I'm lucky enough to be at the table for the COVID task force here at the university and said, we really do need to be paying these folks in some way, shape or form. And it took me just about four months in to get them some type of additional compensation for all of the extra work that they were doing. Um, and you know, after taxes, it is what it is, but they were so excited to get that. Um, I also looked for any opportunities within the current realm of responsibility and business processes that I have control of to see if there was any way I could get them any dollars in the system, be that through packing and shipping students' belongings, any kind of administrative fees that could be routed back to the department and converted over to actual um, money that could be given to them. Um, and so there are a lot of different ways, both the university kicked in a little bit of money, but then we also did what we could here to open opportunities for them um, after hours to do things, but still maintain a work-life balance. I, I wanted them to feel heard. I always remember what it was like to sit in that chair and not feel heard. And so I wanted them to feel heard and know that I cared about them and we cared about them. Um, and that also led to them being put on a priority list for vaccines in our area. So I'm happy to say um, it did take a while up until last week, but everyone is now fully vaccinated on our professional staff team, myself included. So um, that was exciting, but I also recognize that's a state by state thing, much like any, all of these things are state by state. So just some ideas from, from Brandeis. I can. I can share. So um, our same thing, as Tim said, um, in the spring semester, everyone left except for our staff. And um, we're kind of, you know, held holding the bag, um, making sure that students who were here safe got moved safely to emergency housing. Um, and over the summer, we had a lot of students who ended up staying with us over the summer, especially our international students. Um, we've had a revolving door this uh, year. It's been tough off on our living staff, right? Um, and so supporting our living staff that are here who haven't um, left the field, a lot of our staff have left the field. Uh, and it's really hard, right? Um, so one of the things that we continue to do is make sure that our staff are compensated. So um, you know, there's nothing better than saying we 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 appreciate you, we're grateful for you, all those things are great, but if you can't put money towards it, um, how great really is it? Um, and so we, I fought really hard to make sure that our staff who are working overtime um, are getting overload payments. Um, and so if they're taking on additional communities, if they're working additional responsibilities, they're getting overloads. Um, but for our staff who, um, who are unable to work in their regular position, that they had opportunities to work other places this year. So if um, we only had half of our campus return, population return, like most people, um, we had about 4,000 residents return to campus. And so we said, we're gonna have to lay off staff. Uh, there's no way we can um, hold on to all of our 20 resident directors. And our president said, absolutely no way. We're not laying off any staff here at the institution. So um, we reassigned those staff members and they had the opportunity to pick. And um, a lot of them have said, you know, I love this. I love working with our four Maryland ambassadors program. I love working with um, uh, testing and I love being able to use my skills in a different way and giving them opportunities to grow. Um, so a lot of those staff have decided they're not returning back to their resident life role um, that's live in and that they said, I think there's something else I want to do. And I'm really excited about that. But, you know, supporting our staff has not been an easy feat um, because um, sometimes the resident life staff are the forgotten staff um, and are sometimes not thought of as on the front lines as, as other people think. Um, we also have not, our university does not have any vaccines. Um, we've only been given 25 um, from the entire University System of Maryland per week. And so even though our staff are on the list and have been on the list since December, um, we've all had to go out and find our own opportunities and ways to get the vaccine. So um, it's not just my live-in staff, it's also my RAs um, and uh, everyone who's in the resident life staff who are still coming to campus almost every day. So we're supporting them the best way we know how um, while also advocating and trying to make sure that they know that um, we have their backs.
Um, we have been, I, Frankie, I see your, your question in the chat. Um, we have been successful in getting our staff vaccinated as well, like Tim has. Uh, they were on the priority list, um, especially our custodial staff members who sometimes get forgotten. They're the, they're the live-in population while well, they work in. Um, and so our live-in population and our custodial staff were at the top of everyone's list. Um, the Akuhu I letter that was sent out um, helped. Um, our, our director of student health was very empathetic to us and wanted to get them in as soon as possible. And so we've been very successful in that. Um, we're, kind of, we're concerned about mental health. Um, we too were always on campus. We never left. Uh, and so they have been going strong and hard. Um, I thought that we were gonna get more of a break and some relief over our semester break, um, but it just, it flew by. And, and so you had some, you know, as we return, there's excitement, there's, there's those pieces, but it seemed to only last a couple of days before we were pretty burnt out again. Um, we, our university did not do spring break. We did um, wellness days. And so we have been very mindful of trying to create some wellness opportunities in those days that our staff can participate in. We had um, someone come in and do um, med um, meditation. We had um, a walk around campus. We did kind of a Mardi Gras walk around campus um, where we gave swag and prizes and different things like that. Um, we're gonna have um, a uh, name that tune and bingo outside during our next um, wellness day. And so we're trying to find ways where staff can interact um, in a safe manner, uh, but still kind of be mindful of, of the opportunities that are out there to really create interaction because they're really missing that. Um, and so trying to get everybody together and really think about um, mental health because they have been working really hard and have, have been isolated. Yeah, I, so I'll jump in as well. I won't repeat uh, a lot of the things that have been said already, but a few, you know, we've also been very fortunate to be able to vaccinate our, um, our staff um, from fairly early on. Um, we've been incredibly lucky um, to be able to do so. Um, I also, I mean, this has just been an, such a difficult year. Also, I think about our new, new professionals, right, where they came into a job expecting, you know, what, with a vision of what their first professional experience may look like. Um, and they come in and it looks very, very different, right? And so um, trying to really have, um, you know, work through supervisors to just have really honest and open conversations and be empathetic and understanding and try to provide some hope uh, and recognizing that, you know, this isn't permanent and we are gonna be moving forward. You know, I'm, I'm particularly mindful um, too, of the fact that we have, we've also been fortunate that despite the university's hiring freeze, um, that Housing and Residence Life at Tulane has been successful in appealing to um, fill any vacant positions that we've had. And I think about supporting um, our staff. We all know when somebody departs from an organization, um, typically uh, we, we find ourselves in a situation where everybody else has to sort of pick up the slack and, um, and keep things moving forward. And so that's one thing we've, we've been really successful in being able to continue to keep our positions filled, keep our staff employed. Um, and, and on ground and, and in person as much as possible uh, or as much as, as needed um, to, uh, to keep things moving along. I, I mentioned in person too, you know, I think that's interesting for our live-in staff. I, I've been surprised to hear from as many live-in staff asking to work from home. Um, and, and uh, you know, I'll, um, my first reaction probably was, well, your office is just down the down the hall from your apartment or what have you. But really, I, just breaking out of that and thinking about, you know, how can I how can I provide that support to staff and say if that's going to make your your day and your week and so on a little bit easier and a little bit less stressful and so on, then yeah, let's figure it out. Um, I think I think we've all talked about being flexible, um, you know, till till we're blue in the face uh, for the past twelve months, and and that's another example where I'm like, okay, let's just let's work with you and try and figure out how to make it work. Great, thanks for sharing, folks. Um, we will jump to our next topic provided by our registrants, and that is testing and vaccine requirements for, us, for residents. So that may be referring to what are we doing requiring testing on campus currently, and are there plans in the fall for vaccine requirements or testing requirements still, or have we not gone that far in terms of our planning? So I'll pass it over to the panel. It's a great question. At UNT Dallas, we currently require, well, require is such a strong word, but we highly advise um, testing every two weeks for 20% uh, 
of our occupancy. So um, we made some addendums to our contracts to say, being a part of the community, you will be asked to participate in, in testing regularly. So far, we've been we've been testing every two weeks since September, and we've kind of created a a bubble. We've done a good job of creating a, a bubble, and students comply with our testing uh, requirements so far. Um, and it's been it's been good because our our athletes they do their own testing for whatever season like women's minimum's basketball, they did their own testing through athletics. And so it freed up tests for our um, other residents on campus to take. But in terms of the vaccine, we are going to send a pulse survey out to residents in probably June or July with three simple questions, what their plans are for the vaccine or one question with three answers. Um, I've signed up for the vaccine um, I'm not I'm not eligible or fully vaccinated just to get a pulse of who's coming in the door uh, in August. But on move in days, we do rapid testing of anyone coming into the building. So we will continue on with that uh, more so for a peace of mind. And to say at least we know. You know, folks coming into the community um, are not testing positive, uh, but but for our students who come out of state and they get here and they test positive, then we put them up in a in a local hotel to quarantine for two weeks and have meals delivered there. But we're still working through what the vaccine situation will look like, but we'll for sure continue on with testing and maybe even so testing within the residence halls beginning in the fall instead of the student health center. Yeah, from a from a testing standpoint, I mean, Tulane has actually been, we've been testing like crazy, um, our students. I mean, we, um, at peak, we were testing all of our uh, undergraduates who live on campus three times a week. Um, and, you know, at, at, a, at a minimum, at least once a week. Um, and that's, that's like I said, that's been everyone. Um, it's been a robust testing strategy. Um, uh, when we had students arrive on campus, they came through. We, we, we used to have a decentralized move in, and, and I don't want to get into the next topic, but, um, you know, we had an arrival center downtown at one of the hotels, um, and everybody tested um, and meet, needed to have a negative test before they were able to move into the residence halls on campus. We did the same thing again this spring. Um, I'm anticipating perhaps something similar maybe in the fall, um, question mark, uh, but we, uh, we, we will see. From a vaccine standpoint, I think um, like D, I mean, I think there's definitely some question marks there. Um, I, I, um, we're, we're starting to work through um, a couple of different scenarios of, you know, um, of, of what that might look like in terms of requiring the vaccine versus not, um, you know, requiring it for, for students or uh, what about for parents who are helping students perhaps move in. Um, so still working through that, um, but I would anticipate um, that we're going to have probably an answer on that within the next couple of weeks, I think. I can go. So uh, in the fall semester, our test our testing was not as robust as it sounds like a lot of other schools and institutions were. Um, we were only testing once a month, um, but that was it for everyone on the ent entire campus, so graduate students, faculty, staff, um, all students and residential students. So we weren't seeing um, a ton of positive test results come back. Um, however, we, we had to implement a few things like enhanced health precautions. Uh, you don't know what that is because we had to make it up, um, but it actually uh, worked really well where we had to um, sequester and isolate a few halls individually and get them all tested really quickly um, and isolate the positives, right? Um, this semester, we're doing testing every 14 days. So every student and faculty and staff member who comes to campus has to get tested every 14 days in our STAMP student union. The STAMP student union is not only open for food on the food court and testing upstairs, and that's the only thing it's open for. Um, and after you get the vaccine, um, you're still you still have to get the testing requirement, right? Because they are not sure uh, if you're gonna, if you 
if you're exposed to the virus, if you can still give it to someone else. And so our uh, university health center director has said, it doesn't matter if you get the vaccine, great, um, but we're still going to require you to get tested every 14 days for now um, until there's more research out there to find out what's going to happen. Um, in the fall semester, we've been told multiple times, because I've been asking since December, that we cannot require and mandate the vaccine for our students who will be living on campus because it is still in the emergency use only. Um, I did see earlier today our good friends uh, at Rutgers um, their president, Jonathan Holloway, sent an email saying that they are mandating it and it's required for all faculty, staff, and students to come back to campus in the fall. Um, I thought that was a bold statement and I wish that we could get there, but we're just not there yet. Um, and our vaccine pro program is it's non-existent. Um, so you can report that you've had the vaccine um, through our return to campus um, portal. Uh, and really, they said about 3,000 people have said that, or 300 people, maybe 300, 3,000, I don't remember. It started with the three, um, have gotten the uh, vaccine so far and reported it to the institution. So, um, you know, we're, our testing is not as robust, but it seems to be working really well for us, especially with such a large campus population. Um, and it's a central function that's being paid for out of a COVID, um, uh, a COVID fund. So it's not being paid for out of a residential life fund. The University of South Carolina is the same way. We have gone to a more stringent testing policy this spring than we did in the fall. Uh, we went to um, once a month testing. And so we broke all of our students and faculty and staff into uh, four different groups. And every when, when your week comes up, you go and get tested. Uh, we have been really successful in vaccinating um, people. Uh, and so if you are vaccinated, for example, my week was this week to get tested. I just got the second um, dose of my vaccination. And so I do not have to um, go in for any more monthly tests. We're hoping that that will provide some incentive for our students this fall. So when um, we are going to, uh, last fall, we required testing prior to entering into the residence halls. We anticipate doing the same for um, move in and, and for welcome. Um, this fall, uh, unless you have the, the vaccine. So if you can upload your vaccine card to our student health portal, um, you will be cleared. Uh, that will exempt you from all testing. Um, we are actually in conversations with our health center um, on what quarantine looks like. Um, and so uh, our, our vaccinated student population will not be tested. So we don't anticipate any positives coming up. But if you were contact traced, um, they're saying at this point in time that they anticipate they will not need to quarantine either. And so, again, hopeful um, that students will take the vaccine in order to have kind of that convenience factor. Um, and so uh, South Carolina is anticipating that we are going to be at that phase. We were really worried about that, that they wouldn't, students wouldn't be eligible for vaccination until um, you know, August, uh, but we are hopeful that that is going to happen sooner than we anticipated. And so potentially May, um, we're looking at pot potentially doing some kind of vaccination fair type thing before students leave, um, maybe something with move-in as well. Uh, and so we're, we're having a lot of conversations around that, um, but anticipating testing of students in the fall um, if you don't have the vaccine um, yet. I can just speak quickly. It's yes to everything everyone has said pretty much. Um, at Brandeis, we test everyone twice a week. We've been doing that since the beginning. It is insane um, and it's really hard to track compliance. Our conduct system has had an increase of about 50 to 60 percent in cases just from COVID compliance alone. So it caused us some different issues to deal with. Um, we're lucky the fact that we're in Boston surrounded by so much medicine and so much world-class medicine where there's an institute in Cambridge called The Broad who has done um, rapid COVID testing for consortium style contracts of, of uh, universities and colleges and institutions all over Massachusetts. So a lot of schools in and around Boston are using the same testing facility. Uh, in the beginning, it was definitely bumpy because they just got overwhelmed all at one time. Um, but once they nailed down their contracts and, and turnaround times, we get results back um, within 24 hours or less. Sometimes it's as close as eight to 10 hours. Um, so it's been really, really good and helpful for us to be able to isolate those students right away. We do isolate on campus. We have two facilities that we've used for isolation housing. And up until last week, we didn't need the second one, but we did go into that second one last week. Uh, and it has just been, it's been really interesting. Um, I can say, Rachel, our, I see your chat uh, question about the cost. Our contract for 
uh, 1,900 students and around 2,000 faculty and staff ran us between three and $5 million, depending on, on how many tests were submitted. Our testing cost was about $24 per test. Uh, it was expensive. It sure was expensive, but it was the only way to have a viable semester, especially with all the restrictions in Massachusetts. Massachusetts had some very firm restrictions uh, on gathering, distancing, and uh, living, all sorts of restrictions. So in order for us to have a viable and successful year, we chose to go that route. And that was not passed on directly to the students, but of course, it all goes back to the same revenue stream of tuition and housing in order to pay those bills. And there was a small draw off of our endowment in order to pay for some of that. Um, yeah, so just an interesting year overall. Thank you all for sharing on that topic. And I mean, of course, quite a wide array of answers and strategies happening on campuses. Um, and now to the topic that so many of you had asked about um, on our registration, and that is what does fall, summer and fall look like? So certainly our fall opening plans. Um, this is a great opportunity for our panelists to share some of the things that they're experiencing as they're planning for fall. Um, and certainly as, a, as an attendee, would love to have you chime in in the chat if you would share your name and your university, as well as what is your fall opening plan. I think that's great for the entire group that's in that's attending live today. So panelists, I'll pass it over to you. So we have just put in our proposal for our fall plan. So um, we have been approved to do summer camps and conferences. Um, they are looking fairly sparse uh, just for kind of the attendees and, and whatnot, but also our regulations, um, they have to go through two different approval processes. One, um, our approval process, and, and then our soccer team on campus, which is our testing team on campus, they also have to get approved through, through that. Um, group. And so it's a rather strenuous process. We, we figured that our, our um, participants would be down, but there is some hope at some revenue. And so we want to do that um, in the safest way possible and try to help our budget out a little bit. I know all housing programs across the nation are hurting. Uh, and so anything that we can do to kind of help that, that process. Um, we are, uh, for fall, we again are planning on a move-in. We I don't know about you all, but our move-in was really successful last fall. Um, we spread it out to six different days. We had kind of three different days for early move-in and three different days for, for returners um, or new freshmen, um, not early to come in. Uh, and so we are gonna stick with that format, not the whole six days, but we're going to add days to our typical move-in process um, just to slow it down. Uh, we did not have any people um, families, um, administration who, who looked twice at our move-in process. Everyone thought that that, that was really good. Uh, again, we are suggesting that or proposing that all of our students get tested prior to coming in unless they have that vaccine card uploaded into the um, system. Um, we are planning on doing isolation housing. So we took a building offline this year to use that for quarantine and isolation space. We ended up um, also partnering with a couple of hotels um, in uh, our community when our peak hit real quick, real fast, real big. Um, and then we've partnered with the National Advocacy Center, which is here on campus. And so we've been doing a variety of quarantine and isolation. We're proposing that we stop the quarantining and that we quarantine in place um, and that we save rooms for isolation. Um, that will increase our uh, ability to um, bring students in, it'll increase our capacity. Uh, and um, hopefully we, we did some data on that. We're hoping that students go home um, and it looks like um, about 60 beds that we would need when we uh, configured and took quarantine out and just had isolation. That was kind of our peak number. And so that is what we are holding off for isolation housing. Um, we still have some, if this gets approved, we have some work to do. We uh, don't know exactly what our um, meal delivery will look like, but we are hopeful um, that this will be the best options for our students. So that is kind of our plan as of right now. We have a, a running joke on our campus right now that when you understand why pizza is cooked in a circle, 
cut in triangles and served in a square box, then, then you'll understand what the fall plans are. So we can plan as much as we want for our department and the vision, but um, I think probably within the next week, we should know, um, we should have an announcement from the president's office in terms of what the fall will look like. But our plans are to open at 92%, um, all singles, um, no doubles or triples or anything like that, um, and still test um, regularly in the fall term. Um, our student staff, we still wanna operate with a full student staff to recognize the, some of the needs that those leaders have, like they're in the positions because they want to be there or they're in the positions because they have a need. So we're still going to operate with a, with a full student staff occupancy, although we're reducing um, our resident load um, just to um, still honor those commitments that they made and still try to develop um, young leaders. But we should know within a week what the full campus plans will look like. But in terms of our area, we're going to be looking at 92. Uh, percent and a uh, rotating in the office schedule for our professional staff. So who's ever, whoever's on duty for that week, that's the only professional staff that needs to show up to, to campus. And it's been working this term. And so we're gonna continue on with that in the fall. Um, for us at Tulane, I mean, our conference operation is not, I'll be honest, it's not a super robust program to start with, but um, I can say that we're likely to limit um, our summer operation to just Tulane students um, for on-ground summer classes or research or what have you. Um, our pre-college programs um, with minors and so on, we're not, we're not going to be exploring those this summer. Um, and and with, with very few exceptions um, outside groups, um, there are a couple of small groups that we've worked with for a long time that we're going to continue to work with. But, but really, the majority um, we're going to be looking at this summer is our um, um, is our, our Tulane students um, taking summer classes. Um, as far as fall goes, um, contextually, we operate, we, we took a small residence hall, about two and a half percent of our uh, occupancy offline for isolation quarantine this year. Um, we will likely not be holding uh, nearly that many beds offline for next year. Um, so uh, like April, we're going to operate uh, as close to full uh, capacity as we can um, with, with, like I said, holding uh, just a handful of beds for, um, for isolate, mostly just for isolation at this point. One of the other things that we did last year that was um, highly successful, not cheap, but highly successful uh, was with regards to our move-in operation. We, we also spread our move-in out over eight days. It was eight days of joy. It was great. Um, taxing on our staff, um, but very calm and very um, orderly and, and uh, highly effective. What we did though also was we said, look, um, in order to keep um, congestion out of our elevators and lines moving, you know, moving into the residence halls and so on, we ask that you pre-ship all of your belongings with the exception of what you might take on an airplane, right? So you, you have a couple suitcases or what have you. We ask everything else to get sent in ahead of time. And we pre-delivered all of those pieces up into the students' rooms. Um, so it was waiting for them when they got there. Um, highly effective. I suspect we're gonna be doing that again this year, um, although that's not been approved just yet, but I, I think that's where that's gonna land. Um, people ask, what are the, what's one of the things that you hope to continue post COVID um, you know, you know, from a lesson learned? Uh, if we can swing it financially, that would be, I mean, it was a game changer uh, in terms of what the student experience and the family experience was uh, moving in uh, for this year. So that's something we're looking forward to for sure. I'll share a little bit. Um, similar to you all, we did a, um, or to the rest of the panelists, we, we also had a very um, robust move in, but also really great. Like we uh, set up at Xfinity Center um, with the help of our friends over in athletics. So the Xfinity Center is our basketball stadium for the Lady Terps that are still in the, you know, uh, Final 16 or Sweet 16, I don't know what it's called. They're in the basketball tournament, that thing. Um, so uh, we worked with them and we're 
trying to do that again this year, um, except we have 15 days of move in. So we had something that was called set up and go. Um, so if you were local, which most of our students are, um, could come set up their room with their parents, two people um, or a family member or a friend, um, set up their rooms and then also uh, leave uh, and come back when uh, traditional move-in started. If you're an out-of-state student, you took advantage of the um, standard traditional move-in. And so for us, that really worked. Um, so we're really excited about that. And we're, we're asking again if Xfinity I mean, and Athletics will be um, generous uh, to give it to us again and just charge us the cleaning fees like they did last year. Um, but we're, we're making that ask actually this week. We just talked about it yesterday. Um, a few other things. We are offering quarantine and isolation housing um, because we do support all of, uh, all of the College Park area for quarantine isolation for our off-campus students and on-campus students and our on-campus Greek students as well. Um, and so we have about 375 beds that we've taken offline, which is one of our biggest apartment communities and it's going to continue to be offline next year for quarantine isolation. Um, testing will be required in the fall semester. So a letter just went out yesterday from our director of the health center that um, regardless of if, if you have the vaccine, I know I mentioned that earlier, but um, and we're going to 92%. So we're doing singles and doubles. Uh, we're not doing triples and quads. Some of the rooms here at Maryland are massive. Um, it can have, uh, you know, it's basically a double room with like four people in it. Um, we're not doing that anymore. Um, so we're just singles, doubles, and um, we're going back to our full RA staff. Um, we've noticed this year, regardless of how many students are in the halls in the fall semester, we need all the staff because um, our campus is fairly large. And um, it put a really, um, it was a really, stra really straining on the RAs this past fall and spring. Um, we want to make sure that we're supporting the live-in staff for that. Um, the last thing is that our um, conference plans keep changing. So um, they keep changing because the state of Maryland keeps changing um, its protocols and, and standards. And so um, we're trying to get clarity. Um, at first, there was going to be no camps. And then all of a sudden, there may be some in-person camps and there may be some overnight camps. And so um, we're still trying to get clarity on what is actually going to happen this summer. Wow, thank you so much for sharing all those perspectives. So many moving parts in your campuses and I'm certain that's the same with what we're seeing in chat and the folks that are sharing uh, their plans for fall as well. So thank you for chiming in on chat, our attendees, thank you. Um, I am going to move to our open forum and this was really the opportunity for folks that are in the audience to share with us through the Q&A system or through chat um, topics that they'd like us to uh, discuss before the end of our time together today. Um, I did see one uh, question. I'm going to scroll back and find that and bring that up for the group. I, and it had to do with 17 year olds. So as we were talking about uh, vaccine requirements on campus, um, how will how will we handle that on your campuses if you're requiring the vaccine if you are working with students who are under the age of 18? So how will you, what will that factor in your considerations? I can say that has come up in the conversation. I don't think anybody has a good answer for it right now because this vaccine is unlike anything we've we've ever encountered before. Um, the first question I was asked is, well, how do we handle housing contracts for someone who's 17? Well, there's an easy answer for that. We send it to their parent or guardian and they sign it. Um, the student also signs it and we archive it. It's a little different with a vaccine for a lot of different reasons. So it's a no answer answer. We don't have uh, much guidance at all uh, in Massachusetts on that yet. We're just not there, but I do, it is at least in the queue. So I do feel like we are going to get some guidance very soon. Thanks, Tim. Well, as our attendees potentially brainstorm other topics they'd like to bring up, um, I did want to share a few upcoming virtual opportunities to engage with the KUI that are coming up. You'll see those on your screen now. Um, we have, I lost count, but I would say over 10 opportunities in essentially the month of April to come together and connect. We've got a variety of topics and communities. Um, so certainly stay tuned to our weekly connections uh, newsletter that we send out on Tuesday afternoons. It's a great way to continue to be connected with all the things happening at KUI related. Um, you know, whether we've moved to virtual for a number of our things or we get back to in person soon, we have really uh, 
really turned up the, not, the volume when it comes to making sure that we're offering things that make sense for your professional development on your campuses and providing low cost and free options. And really our ability to do what we can do, what our, the ability for COI to support the field really comes from mere membership dollars. So thank you for being a member of COI. We are really all in this together. Um, I'm going to pass it over to our panelists. Um, they've all they have all been received a prompt earlier where I'd like them each to share some parting thoughts with the audience today um, before we close up our time. So I will pass it back to the panel for parting thoughts. Who wants to part first? No, I know. I was, I was waiting. I know. For you. I know. I'll, I'll go. <laughs> there you go. So I have I have two parting thoughts. One um, is a link that I'll throw in the chat. Um, as in my second life and at other duties as assigned, I'm the vice chair for the regional cabinet of the Akuho I Foundation, and we are running a campaign for the 70th anniversary of Akuho I. So if you can find it within yourself to be kind and donate at least nineteen dollars and fifty one cents, you'll be part of the club. And there will be some VIP events and a lot of exciting things happening for the 70th. So um, head over there, make a donation, and we'll be in touch with you. Uh, there'll be some uh, trivia nights and some exclusive things just for folks that are in the 1951 club. So check that out if you get a chance. As far as all of this, my biggest piece of advice to folks is to leverage your networks and, and leverage your connections within your networks, especially in your state. If you're lucky enough to be part of a giant state system, then you know, you already have that organically built into your structure, but for those of us at small privates or mid-sized privates, we don't really have that. We, we can reach out to each other. We definitely do that here in Massachusetts. There's even so strange things happening county to county in Massachusetts. So it's been interesting to hear what our friends are doing just out west in Worcester or in Metro Boston or Metro West or even one state away in Rhode Island. Life is totally different. So it's been really, really great to connect with other folks and just send a quick email to say, hey, can you take a look at this? What are you doing in your area? And to hear that feedback. Uh, it's also awesome to connect with folks in the Akuhoi communities because we're all definitely in this together. It's totally cliche, but it is the truth. And we're all doing, you've heard it today, we're all doing the exact same things just in very different ways on our campuses to give it the flair of, you know, whatever local municipality we're in or whatever type of institution we're in. So Leverage your networks, talk to your, your peers. Don't be afraid to reach out. I know I'd be happy to connect with anybody if they had any questions. And I'm sure I, the fellow panelists would agree that they would be willing to do that as well uh, because you shouldn't, you shouldn't take it all on your shoulders. There are other people doing the exact same things and it'd be great to just share ideas so you can maybe be that person that hits the ball right out of the park on your campus because you borrowed an idea from a friend. That's totally fine. Um, and what we're best known for in, in housing and res life and student affairs. My parting advice is that um, somebody told me some time ago that comparison is the thief of joy. And, you know, don't compare your process to anyone else's process. Just just plan and execute with with confidence because you're the subject matter experts. Although this is a new um, challenge that we're having to do with every day, you're still on the ground doing the work. So just um, just don't compare your process to others and do what you do. I love Dee's analogy of triangle pizza, circle pizza and square box. I'm gonna use that, I'm stealing that. I love that um, because things keep changing. I think that um, I've over looking past over, uh, looking past over the last year, um, you look and see all the things that you dealt with in the moment and, and you really led through a, a global pandemic which we've not done before um, and so being able to be flexible and continue on. Um, I love that we're having the conversations about our uh, living professionals, but we too have been working since day one. Like we didn't, we didn't leave campus. And so make sure that you're looking after yourself too. I think that that's really important. Um, I love Tim's advice about your networks. Um, we have a couple of networks that, that we get to go to for for a variety of things that the SEC uh, listserv pops up every um, couple of days with with thoughts and and how you, how do you do things? 
um, I was able to attend um, the state of the profession and we are still meeting in our little cohort and I, I cherish that time because I get to step out of the weeds for a minute or two and really think kind of at that bigger picture level. Um, we're having some amazing conversations about our live-in staff, our resident mentors or resident advisors. Um, and so we're looking at, at some of those things big picture. And I feel like I've not gotten to do that a lot in the last year because we're so down in the weeds and we have to figure out how students are going to get meals on a daily basis. And so um, I encourage you to find those places that bring you joy. I had um, a fireside chat, if you would, with one of the, the past CEO presidents um, a little bit ago. And she was telling me to do the things that, that bring you joy. And I was like, oh, that's that's amazing. Sometimes you forget to do that. So I would leave that as my parting thought. Well, following all this great advice is, is difficult. I mean, this is, this is all gold. Um, really, I, I'd underscore all of it. Um, but I, I'd also say, I mean, at this point, um, it's, it's easy to get, as April said, right? It's easy to get stuck in the details and the processes at this point where it's, it's taking care of our people. Um, and, and my focus is on, on my team and their, their well-being and their ability to persist through, um, through, this, um, through these situations that we keep every day. It's another twist. It's another turn. It's another opportunity to pivot. Um, but um, we'll, the details, they'll, they'll, they will get worked out. We have talented people on campus, but um, worrying about our people at this point and, and making sure they're, uh, they're well and, and supported is, is priority number one at this point. Yeah, that's all really hard to follow. Um, the only parting advice I had was uh, continuing to keep motivating your team, right? And uh, to take a break for yourself, right? Um, we're going into, um, gosh, month 12 now of this pandemic and of working nonstop and pivoting and, and changes. And so recognizing that we all have a lot of leave time um, saved up um, to make sure that we're taking that time for ourselves and making sure that we're actually role modeling and modeling what, um, you know, one of our mentors used to say, uh, it's not about, uh, you know, balance, it's about recalibrating. And, um, and so uh, how do we recalibrate and show our team? How do we um, kind of get back to what the new normal, and I don't like that term, but uh, how do we make sure that we're um, coming back into the, the new year, a new academic year um, healthy? Gosh, thank you all so much for those parting thoughts. Um, I'm going to close this up today. So thank you so much for your attendance. Um, if you'd like to share any kudos with our panelists today, feel free to do that in the chats as we are ending our session. Um, again, please be mindful of all the outstanding opportunities that we have to connect um, virtually over the next month and moving forward through a QOI. Um, and as many of our panelists said, and I've said, we really are all in this together. So let's continue sharing ideas, sharing resources and connecting with one another um, best of luck to all of you as we continue moving through spring and getting closer to summer. Thanks again for attending.